My name is uh, David Richards, and I've been a Christian for uh, 57 years. A lot of those years, I was kind of confused about Jesus' death. I always knew to be a Christian, to, to accept salvation, I had to believe in Jesus' death and his resurrection. But I always had a question in my mind about why did Jesus have to die for my sins? And why did Jesus have to die such a cruel, violent death? Jesus is God's only son, it tells us in Scripture. And why would he allow his son to go through something like that on the cross? Well, after many years of reading the Bible, meditating, and studying on the Bible, I believe the Lord has provided me some answers to some of those questions. And I would like to share some of the things that I have learned over the years with you. Now, before we can talk about Jesus' death and what all that means, first of all, we've got to understand something about God and his relationship to man. So I would like to go back to the beginning uh, of creation and I'm going to read a scripture and I invite you to uh, join me in reading that scripture. I will have that scripture on a slide so that you can find it. And I'll be referring to several scriptures, but there's going to be a few key scriptures that I'm going to invite you to, to uh, read along with me. So the first scripture we're going to look at here is in Genesis. Uh, Genesis 1, verses 26 27. Genesis 1, 26, 27. <clears throat> then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. According to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish in the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him male and female. He created them. So we see here in Scripture uh, at, during the creation that God made man in his image, in his likeness. Well, let's talk about exactly what does that mean. I mean, when you think about it, <clears throat> our physical body is nothing like his body. Our, his, our body are, is physical, where his body is spiritual. Because our bodies are physical, we're limited. But God is not limited in anything. He's all-knowing. He's everywhere. He's all-powerful. So our bodies are nothing like God's. But I believe what that means there, that we've been made in His likeness, is that we have a soul like God's soul. God gave us a mind. God has a mind. God gave us emotions. God has emotions. And God gave us a will. And that, probably more than anything else about our soul, is more like God than anything. We've been given the right to choose. And so, uh, in, in that way, we're in the likeness of God. Well, why did God make us in the, in the first place? Um, well, at Scripture, I think we can see the reason why God made man. In Jeremiah 30, 22, it talks about that God desires a people and he wants to be their God. So God wants to make a connection with man and woman. Well, what kind of connection is that? How can you connect as a human to a holy God? 
Well, God does not want a type of connection where he's up in heaven and we're down here on earth. And there's a tremendous distance when we think about that. That's not the type of relationship God wants to have with, with man. God wants a relationship. And that relationship, God is here with us. Um, and the relationship that God wants to have with us is a bond of love. And once man or a woman makes that connection with God in love, nothing can separate that. That actually tells us that in Romans 8.35, that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ. So it is a powerful bond. And... Um, uh, and, and, there's a, and there's a desire within, built within our soul to fulfill that purpose of why God made us, to make that connection with God. And uh, that, that relationship, that bond of love, and tells us in Isaiah 43, 7, that that, that relationship then glorifies God. So when... God made Adam and Eve for that love relationship uh, when uh, at, at, right after creation, Adam and Eve walked with God, everything was perfect, and there was a love relationship that was growing from that until someone came along to disrupt everything. Now, who is that that I'm talking about? Well, I'm talking about Satan, and Satan is real. You cannot deny that Satan's existence if you go by what Scripture says, because there's a lot of Scripture that talks about Satan and the reality of Satan. Now, um, his whole purpose tells us in John 10.10, that the thief comes to kill, destroy, and to steal. The main thing that Satan is wanting to steal and destroy is that love relationship between us and God. And so right off the bat, we, we see Satan come on the scene with Adam and Eve to tempt them to disobey God. And, um, and to break that relationship. And the main way he breaks that relationship with us is by getting us involved in sin. And as soon as sin enters our life, then that breaks that bond of love and that relationship that we have with God. And so we, if we look at uh, 1 John 3.10, uh, we see here that not all humans are are going to have that love relationship, that bond with God. Because it talks about that there are some that are children of God, and then there are some that belong to Satan. Those who do not practice righteousness, they belong to Satan. Those that do practice righteousness, they belong to God. Uh, <clears throat> well, Let's talk about Satan. Now, where did Satan come from, and why did Satan, why did God allow Satan just to come in and, and to uh, cause all this dis disruption of the desire he has to make this relationship between him and man? Well, if you go to Ezekiel uh, chapter 28, verses 11 to 19, those verses describe Satan's or uh, or how he began. Um, and in those scriptures, we see that God created Satan. But he didn't create Satan to be evil. He created Satan to be an angel. And not just any angel, but Satan was a beautiful angel that had lots of wisdom, lots of power. And all of that went to his head. 
he no longer, he got to the point where he no longer wanted to serve God, but he wanted others to serve him. And he wanted to be like God. And that caused him to rebel against God, and then he was cast out of heaven because of that pride he had of wanting to be like God. Now the next time we hear about Satan is when he's in the garden tempting Eve and Adam to disobey God. And uh, so let's talk about that temptation uh, that uh, he provided Adam and Eve to disobey God. Uh, let's turn to another scripture now. Uh, I want to look at Genesis, go back to Genesis, and I want to look at Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So what is God saying here? What is the consequences of disobeying God and eating the unforbidden fruit? It's death. Um, now, <clears throat> we actually see the temptation play out between Satan and Adam and Eve in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses uh, uh, 1 to, one to uh, 8. And so Satan comes to Eve and he basically says, did God really tell you that you couldn't eat of any tree? Well, God told them he, they could eat of any tree except the tree of good and uh, knowledge of good and evil. So you can see where he's twisting the truth, and that's exactly what he does all the time. And so he went on again to talk about how the fruit was pleasing to the eye. But the real thing that made Eve fall for the temptation to take a bite of the unforbidden fruit and to uh, disobey God is when Satan told Eve that if she took a bite of the fruit that she would be as wise as God. And that was the temptation that finally got to her to act on that and to disobey God. And that was the first disobedience of God by man and the first sin by man. Um, and Satan's still doing that today. He's, he's providing those temptations and a lot of it does have to do with pride and being like God. Uh, to make us fall and, and break that uh, relationship that we have uh, with God. And um, <clears throat> there was a tremendous change that took place after Eve took the forbidden fruit and ate of it and gave it to Adam and he ate of it. Right after that there was a tremendous change that took place. No longer was Adam and Eve in a paradise, but they was actually cast out of the perfect creation that God made for them. One of the big changes that took place right after the fall is that Satan became the world leader after this, the world ruler. And there's a couple of scriptures in the Bible that confirms this. One I want to refer you to is in John chapter 12, 31, where it talks about God's judging Satan at the end of the world. And 
John calls him in these scriptures the ruler of the world. That's his title, the ruler of the world. And then another scripture that confirms this is in 1 John 5.19, where John here says that Satan, uh, uh, the whole world lies in Satan's power. Confirming the, the, uh, the belief, not only the belief, but the actuality, the reality, that Satan is the, ro the ruler of this fallen world, and he still is. Um, <clears throat> well, there's one thing I want you to think about. I want to refer back to a back into Genesis during the creation, uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 30, after God made Adam and Eve, he made them the ruler of the known world at that time before the fall. He gave them dominion over the world and he, gave, and he told them and commanded them to subdue it. So they were the rulers of the world. So what happened here? How did Satan all of a sudden now he's become the ruler of the world? Well that happened right after the fall. Uh, when Adam and Eve was cast out of the, the world that God created and they was cast out into a fallen world where they was no longer the ruler. They no longer had dominion but now Satan was the ruler of the world and he has been ever since. So he took that uh, dominion over the earth from man and uh, woman by tempting them to sin and disobey God and therefore he became the ruler of the world. He has all power in the world. Now when I say that, he is limited by God's power. He'll never be powerful as God, but he is the ruler of this world. He's the dark prince of this world. Um, <clears throat> so something else entered the world right after the fall and to look at that I want to I want to go back and refer back to Genesis 2:17 which we read just a little while ago in that verse again it tells us that God told Adam and Eve that as soon as they ate the the forbidden fruit that they would die now we know through scripture that Adam and Eve didn't die right then and he told them they'd die immediately. So what the, what did God mean by that? Well we need to understand that word death as far as it, the meaning biblically. If we look at that word death through the Hebrew and the Greek and what the Bible actually means by that, death means separation. And there are two kinds of separations by death. First is the physical. Now the physical death separates the soul from the body. And the second death is a spiritual death. And a spiritual death is when the soul is separated from God. So Adam and Eve didn't die physically, but they did die spiritually. As soon as Eve disobeyed God, then that broke that relationship they had and separated Eve and her soul from God. And, um, <clears throat> and after the fall, God enacted a law that cannot be changed. And it's an eternal law. He himself will not change this law. So I want to turn to scripture, and this is one I want us to read together. And uh, this time we're in the, the New Testament, uh, Romans. We're going to look at Romans 8-2 concerning the law that God started right after the fall. Romans 8-2. 
For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. So you can see there's two laws there. There's the law of the Spirit of life in Christ, which we're going to talk about later. And then there's the law of sin and death, and that's the one I want to talk about. The law of the Spirit of life was initiated, was started by God when Christ died on the cross. The law of sin and death was initiated and started at the fall when Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed God by eating the forbidden fruit. Well, what does that law of sin and death mean? Well, the law of sin and death means that if a person sins, then they are going to experience death. Let me say that again. The law of sin and death means if anyone sins, then they're separated from God. That's the death, spiritual death. And also the physical death. Uh, eventually it will separate your body from your soul. Um, <clears throat> another scripture I'll refer you to is in Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin is death. Anyone sins, the consequence is spiritual death and eventually physical death. Immediately spiritual death, but eventually physical death. Um, so how many times do you have to sin before that law takes effect? Once once. That sin, that disobe disobedience, that rebellion against God, it immediately breaks the relationship, the love bond that God wants to have with the us. Now is there anybody that I'm talking to right now that has never sinned? So we've all are under the law of sin and death because we've all sinned and we've all broke that relationship with God. So because of the fall there are two consequences. There's lots of things that change but there's two main consequences of the fall. One is that Satan became the ruler of the world, and he's still the ruler of the world. And the second is that it allowed death to enter to the world. The fall of Adam and Eve um, by disobeying God and eating that forbidden fruit some of the consequences of that brings into question God's motive for having a relationship with us, desiring that relationship of love. Why was God's punishment so severe for that act of disobedience by eating that forbidden fruit? It, in, in our minds, it seems like the consequences is unreasonable. And why didn't God give Adam and Eve a second chance? That was their first act of dis disobedience. And why did God in the first place allow Satan to be there in the garden to tempt them to break that relationship? To answer those questions and to understand, we need to look at God's perspective in the type of relationship that He wants with us instead of the relationship we want with God. We've already said that God desires a relationship that is bonded in love a tight relationship with Him. Not one that's distant, but one where He is with us 
every day of our life. That's the type of relationship he desires. But there is something else that God requires of us to have a relationship with him. And I want to read that scripture and turn to it. And this particular scripture is in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 15. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 and 15. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit and fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you in the, at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your, in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all behavior because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So, the requirement that God has for us is that if we want that fellowship with God, then there has to be a change in our heart, a desire to be holy, like God is holy, to have that relationship. Um, <clears throat> and so this speaks about the severity of the fall. Uh, the one act of disobedience broke that relationship because it broke the holiness that was the righteousness of Adam and Eve's heart. And by doing that, that immediately broke the relationship they had with God. And that was their whole purpose, was that relationship with God. That's why God made them for that relationship. So this was a tremendous act of rebellion and disobedience towards God and a rejection of God. It's basically what they was telling them, no, we do not want that relationship. We want this instead. And that's why it was so severe and that's why they didn't have a second chance at it because it broke it immediately uh, when they, 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 uh, they acted on that disobedience and sinned against God. Well, what about Satan? Why did God allow Satan to be there in that garden that God created in order to tempt Adam and Eve to disobey God and to break the relationship. Why did he allow that? <clears throat> the initial reason why God allows Satan to be in that garden is to allow an opportunity for Adam and Eve to exercise that free will that God gave them at creation. Now, by eating the apple, talking about them, what was the name of the tree that they ate the fruit from, it was the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now they have a choice. Now they can exercise that choice. They can either choose good or they can choose evil. You know, they can either choose God or they can choose to line up with Satan. Uh, and so it gave them that exercise to, it gave them the right to exercise that free will that God gave them that was like his will. Um, now, once a person uh, turns and believes in God and chooses good, chooses God over evil and over Satan, and becomes a believer and is covered by the blood of Christ, now, God is using Satan for a different reason. <clears throat> God is using Satan now to provide a temptation to choose sin. He's using Satan to test us 
to provide a trial to strengthen our faith. Um, that's the other thing about our relationship with God. God wants a holy relationship, and for that to be holy, then there has to be a holy character that's being built. I'm not talking about perfection here. Uh, we can't be perfect like Christ. We will stumble and we will fall. But God is looking for that heart that desires righteousness, that desires to walk away from sin. Uh, that's the character uh, that he's looking for in that relationship that he has with each one of us. Uh, and so he's using Satan uh, to actually provide those trials so that we become overcomers, that we overcome evil, that we overcome Satan. Uh, and that is extremely important to God, that we do build that character of being an overcomer. Now, if you don't believe me, go to Revelations and read chapters 2 and 3 in Revelations. In those seven letters that um, Jesus wrote to the seven churches, in each one of those letters, he talks about the blessings and the promises that comes with being an overcomer. And so, <clears throat> in spite of of all the destruction and all the evil that Satan brings with him and being the ruler of this world and being the author of evil and all the souls that he's broke that relationship with God. In spite of that, God is using Satan to build our faith and to build the character of an overcomer. And it all comes down to our choice and exercising that free will that God provided for each one of us. We can establish to have that holy, loving relationship with God, or we can choose to continue to live a life uh, of sin uh, and be eternally separated from God. Okay, now I want to talk about Jesus' death and what Jesus' death uh, accomplished. Um, to start uh, this conversation, I want to turn to a scripture in Romans. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. Well, who was that one man that allowed sin to enter? It's talking about Adam, and of course Eve's along with that, that ate that forbidden fruit and allowed sin to come in and enter into the world. Now, uh, we can't lay our sins on Adam and Eve and blame Adam and Eve for our sins. It's our sins that rebel and disobey God. And it's our sins that breaks that relationship that God desires with us. But again, we see that Adam introduced that the sin in, into the world. Uh, so because of sin, again, the law of sin and death, every one of us sin. So every one of us is going to have to experience death. Now we're all going to experience physical death, the separation of our soul from our body. And, and it, we see that. It's very obvious. There's an old saying that uh, the only thing that you can, uh, have to do is pay taxes and you have to die. Well, I don't know about paying taxes, but it's true about everyone has to experience death. And the reason is, is because of the sin in every one of our lives. Well, what about spiritual death? Uh, is there a chance that, you know, spiritual death is when our soul is separated from God. Is there a chance that that relationship can be restored so that we don't experience that particular death? Well, I think it, Scripture makes it plain 
that there is a way of restoring our relationship. Uh, and uh, so let's read that scripture uh, that, that talks about this. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 to 22. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 to 22. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. Now, when it talks about those that are asleep, they're talking about those that are dead in, in Christ. For since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as Adam all die, and also in Christ all will be made alive. So you see, Adam and Eve, as we talked about before, they're the ones that introduced sin into the world. But one, by one man, and that one man is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, he brings about life. Now, what does it mean in that verse that Jesus brings life? Well, he's talking about making a reconciliation with God concerning our sin and our rebellion against God so that that relationship can be mended and we can continue to have that relationship we're meant to have. Uh, and again, that's the reason why we are created is to have that relationship with God. And uh, so it all centers around Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Well, that brings up a good question. Uh, what about that law of sin and death? You know, when we was talking about that, we were saying that that was a law that God enacted at the fall, and that cannot be changed. That's an eternal law, uh, and God himself is not going to change that. So what about that? Well, if you remember when we looked and read about that law in Romans 8.2, there was actually two laws. The other law was the spirit of life that's in Jesus Christ. That law nullifies the law of sin and death. Because what that scripture says is that the law of the spirit of life frees us from the law of sin and death. So it cancels it out. And again, that whole law of the spirit of life is centered around Jesus Christ and what Jesus did for us on the cross so that we can regain that relationship with God in spite of our, our, our personal sins. Well, how did Jesus' death accomplish this new law? Well, if we look at Titus 2.14, it tells us in that particular verse that Jesus' death redeemed us uh, from death so that, once again, God would have a people that he could have a relationship with. That word redeem, that's the word I want to look at. What does that word redeem mean? Well, the word redeem means buy back. And so the whole idea here is that Jesus Christ's death is buying back our souls from death. Um, and so what we're seeing and what we're seeing here is that one of the things that Jesus accomplished on the cross is that he bought our souls back from that old law of sin and death. Now the question here now comes to be, well, who is Jesus buying us back from? Now to answer that question, we have to go to the Old Testament, and we got to look at Hosea, and I know Hosea is a hard chapter to find, so you may want to pause the video to find it, but we're looking for Hosea chapter 13, verse 14, Hosea 13, 14. Now, in this particular verse, um, 
it's talking about Israel and Israel's sin, but it can also refer back to us. Shall I ransom them from the power of Sheol, hell? Shall I redeem them from death? O death, where are your th thorns? O hell, O Sheol, where is your sting? Compassion will be hidden from my sight. So what the scripture here is telling us, this is God talking about Israel's sin. Should he redeem them from hell and from death? So in this scripture, we're beginning to see that we are redeemed. Our soul is redeemed because of our sin is being bought back from death and hell. Now think about this for a minute. What am I saying here? Is death in hell a, a spiritual being? That's exactly what I'm saying. And there are other scriptures that goes along with this. And so let's look, talk about them for a minute. We won't turn to them, but let me kind of refer you to them. And you may want to look this up just to, to, to get this in your mind that death and hell are spiritual beings. In Revelation 6, 8, it talks about death and hell riding on horses in a prophecy and during the tribulation, and they take a, a fourth of the world's population. They kill a fourth of the world's population. Revelation 20, 13, 14 talks about God's great judgment at the end of the world and he judges death and hell and casts cast them in to the lake of fire. This is all talking about spiritual beings and uh, the work of uh, uh, death separating our body from our soul and then hell holding our soul in prison in hell. Um, it, Proverbs 27, 20. Look at that scripture. It talks about death's and hell's insatiable appetite for man's soul. It's ne they're never satisfied. They want to claim all souls uh, and, and hold our souls into hell. Uh, and, and David confirms this. Uh, King David in Psalms uh, 16, 10 he, he knows by his faith and his hope in God, his Father, that he, tell, he says in this verse, I know that God will not abandon my soul in hell, and he will not allow the Holy One to see decay. The Holy One he's talking about there is Jesus Christ. Um, <clears throat> the redemption are the reprise that was paid for the redemptions of our soul was not cheap. In Hebrews 10, 12, it talks about that Jesus himself was the payment. He was the sacrifice that was made. The, the, God's very own son that he loved was the payment, was the redemption for, for our souls. Uh, and we'll, let's look at that scripture to verify this. Uh, we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 19. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 to 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. Again, he is the payment uh, that's paid to death and hell to redeem our souls. And when it talks about Jesus' blood being spotless, being, being without blemish, what that means is that there was no sin in Jesus' life. 
And for him to remain sinless while he lived his life in this fallen world with Satan being the ruler for 30 years it is way beyond my belief and understanding as I've experienced the corruption in this world. And not that he wasn't tempted, because in Hebrews 4.15 it tells us that Jesus was tempted in every way that we're tempted, but without sin. And Satan himself tried to tempt Jesus to disobey God, just like he tried to tempt even Adam to disobey God. But the difference here is that Jesus did not fall for that temptation. He did not act on that temptation and he remained faithful and obedient for his purpose to go to the cross to make that payment to hell, death and hell to redeem our souls so that once again we could have that relationship with God that he's always intended it for us to have. Wow. Wow. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 17. Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 17. Therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise also partook of the same, talking about Jesus. In order for Jesus to be the sacrifice, he had to become human like me and you so that his blood was shed and that was the blood that, of course, again, you know, like was the payment uh, for our souls. Um, so let me go on and read the, more of this particular scripture. Um, <clears throat> that through death, his death, Jesus' death, that he might render powerless him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. Before Jesus died on the cross and paid that payment, Satan was the one that had uh, power over death and hell. Satan was the one that has tempted man and got man involved in sin so that the consequences of sin and death would take effect and then death and hell would claim that soul. That happened all the way from creation all the way up to the point of Jesus' death on the cross. <clears throat> but what we're seeing here, that there was a change that took place concerning that law of sin and death right there on the cross. Um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and, and finish the scriptures here of uh, 14 to 17. Um, <clears throat> in, in, because of Jesus' death, and might free those who through fear of death were subject to slave, slavery all their lives. For surely he does not give help to angels, but he gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brethren in all things, so that he might become merciful and faithful high priest in th things pertaining to God, to make prohibition, uh, pro pro uh, sorry, uh, prohibition, for the sins of the people. In other words, uh, to make it, make, make it right between us and God because of our, our sins. Uh, so 15 says that before Christ died, all of mankind was slavery to death and feared death. And there's a good reason why they feared death, because there was no escape from the death and hell to claim their souls. And Jesus 
Jesus Christ, the Son of God, changed that. Let's look at uh, what happened after Jesus' death. In Ephesians 4, 8 to 9, it talks about that Jesus, after he died on the cross, went into the lower parts of the earth. Now, I believe that that was uh, the hell, the prison where hell and death were holding the souls, that all the souls that died from to the time of Adam. When he went down into the lower parts of the earth, he met face to face with, with death and hell. But there was something different about this time when, when his soul came in contact with death. Before, death was able to claim all souls, and hell was able to hold those souls in hell because all had sinned. But in this case, as it says in Acts 2, 24 to 28, death could not hold on to his soul. And the reason is, is because there was no sin. So the, the law of sin and death did not apply to his life. And then in Ephesians, back in Ephesians 4, it tells us that he freed the captives. Now, who were the captives? Well, I believe the captives were those Old Testament saints that put their faith in God. And just like David, King David said in Psalms 16.10, I know that God will not abandon my soul in hell. He will not allow the Holy One to see decay. The Holy One was Jesus Christ. And after his death, he did not see decay. Um, and so... We see in Matthew 27, 52, and uh, 53 that after Je Jesus' death that there were souls that came out of the grave. And I believe that this, it was those that, that Jesus freed from the, the captivity of hell so that they could uh, go to uh, heaven to be with God, uh, with Christ. And so... On that very day, there was a tremendous victory that was oh, a Jesus' death, overcame death. Um, and that death also applies to us now. That his blood from his sacrifice covers us that put our faith in Christ so that death can no longer claim our soul. Hell can no longer hold our soul into hell. And uh, let's read that in Scripture. This is a powerful Scripture about death. And it's in 1 Corinthians 15. So I want to turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 to 57. But when this perishable talking about our bodies, they are going to perish eventually. And when we, we come to the point where there will be physical death, when we experience physical death. But when the perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on the immortality, then will come about the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because he won the victory over death through his death on the cross. And that brought in a whole new law, which is the law of life in the spirit through Jesus Christ. The eternal gift of, of, of life with Christ for, and with God for an eternity. And that can only be accomplished. We can only experience that because of what Christ did on that cross to overcome death and hell so that they could not claim our soul after death. What about, let's talk about what Jesus had to endure just to get to the cross. <clears throat> Again, now, when Jesus was here, 
and his mission was to be that sacrifice for our sins, he was human and he was tempted in all ways that we are tempted. And, and so when his ministry started, <clears throat> after he was baptized, God led him out into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan himself. And we see in Matthew 4, 1 through 11, that there was three temptations that Satan get, provided for uh, Christ to get him to disobey God and to be involved in sin so that sin and death, that law of sin and death, would apply to him and there would be no victory over, over uh, Satan and death and hell. And one of the first temptation was when Satan tempted uh, Jesus to turn the, the, uh, the rocks into bread. And you've got to remember that uh, at this point that Jesus was on a fast for 40 days and 40 nights so that he was experiencing a tremendous hunger. So this would be quite a temptation for Christ to do that. But Jesus knew to do that in his own strength without the guidance of God would be a sin and disobedience and he did not fall for that. And the second thing that Satan tried to do was to get Jesus to jump off the highest point on the temple to prove to people that he was the Son of God. Well, again, God didn't get instruct Jesus to do that, so he knew that would be disobedience against God's will. So he did not fall for that temptation. And then the third and last temptation that Satan uh, provided uh, Christ was when he showed him the whole world. Remember, he's the prince of this world. He's the ruler of the world. And he said, I will give you the whole world, Jesus, if you'll just bow down and follow me. Well, Jesus knew that that, that was against God's will. And that would break his relationship with God. And he did not fall for that either. So, after Satan realized that he was not going to be able to provide any kind of a temptation and deception to get Jesus to disobey God and get him involved in sin and break that relationship between him and God. Then he turned and started looking at Jesus Christ's death. <clears throat> Satan, who was the ruler of the world, started manipulating circumstances in men's evil heart to engineer Jesus' death, the way he was going to die, and he was going to make it so horrible that Jesus would, hopefully that's what he's hoping, that Jesus would forsake his mission of going to the cross and dying for us as a sacrifice. Well, Satan started working in the Pharisees' heart and mind, and they were the religious men at that time, to reject Jesus Christ and they demanded that the Roman authority, which is Pontius Pilate at the time, was going to, would uh, crucify Christ. Now let's talk about crucifixion, Roman crucifixion for a minute. Roman crucifixion was a very cruel punishment for those who would rebel against the Roman Empire. And they would hang men upon a cross and they would linger there for days, suffering uh, all kinds of pain and agony until they finally got so weak that the piece of wood that they were standing on on the cross, their legs would give out and they collapse their lungs and they would suffocate. Now while these men were hanging on the cross, it was a spectacle for everyone to see and it was a deterrent to make sure that no one ever thought about trying to rebel against the Roman Empire. Well, the night uh, before Jesus was crucified, Satan attacked Jesus' mind and made sure he knew exactly the, 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 uh, the horrible death that Jesus was going to suffer through the crucifixion. And there was a tremendous fear that overtook uh, Jesus' heart. And we see that in, in Luke twenty-two forty-four, that 
his pores on his face dilated to the point because of all the stress and thinking about that death that he actually sweat drops of blood. <clears throat> In Matthew, we see that Jesus went to prayer to find uh, a, a strength from God. And Jesus said in that prayer that if there was any way that God could remove that cup, let it be. In other words, he was telling God, if there's any other way of dying other than facing that cross, then let it be. But Jesus didn't finish that prayer there. Jesus went on to say, not my will, but your will be done. And as soon as he said that, that was that act of obedience, of willingness to be able to go and suffer on that cross, to be that sacrifice for our sins. And that is the moment when Jesus said those words that Satan lost the battle, that Jesus won the victory over sin, over, uh, sin, over, over death, over hell, and no longer from that point on was death going to be able to, to de, uh, claim all souls and allow hell to imprison all souls in hell. Now Jesus is the ones with the keys of death and hell, as it tells us in Revelation, and he's the one that says, who goes to hell and who doesn't go to hell. <clears throat> Let's go back to our original questions we asked at the beginning of this video. One of the questions was, well, why did Jesus have to die for my sins? Because when I experience physical death, I have no way because of my sin to keep death and hell from claiming my soul and taking my soul to hell. The only hope that I have is what Christ did on that cross. And through my faith and through my belief, accepting that sinless blood that Jesus covered me to prevent death and hell from claiming my soul. And that's why Jesus has to die for my sins. And that's why Jesus has to die for your sins. Well, let's look at that other question we asked at that time. Why did God allow his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer all the pain that came with that crucifixion. <clears throat> there are some who believe that the cross was an expression of God's wrath against our sin. I do not believe that. The cross was an expression of God's love for us and providing that sacrifice for our sin so we wouldn't have to face death and hell. Uh, and so it was, it was Satan who put Jesus on that cross. It was not God that did that, but God allowed that so that the sacrifice could be finished and the sacrifice be finished for our sins. There are two things that Jesus accomplished for us on the cross. And I want to read about those in Romans 5.10. Romans 5.10. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So we see the two things that Jesus accomplished for us, and they're wonderful, um, through, through his obedience of dying on that cross. One is the reconciliation it talks about in his death. A reconciliation between us and God and to overcome that sin so that we can be uh, re reunited uh, to our Heavenly Father. And the second thing it talks about is by his life that we are saved. What are we saved from? We're saved from death and hell.
Uh, and so, again, those are the two things that Jesus accomplished for us that we could not accomplish within ourselves. Um, so let's look, about, let's look at each one of those for a minute. Let's talk about the reconciliation. The reconciliation is talking about the atonement work of the cross. In other words, the forgiveness of our sins so that they're no longer a object between us and God. And uh, it's, the scriptures makes it plain that once God forgives us of sin, that they're completely wiped out. Now we're talking about uh, uh, past sins, present sins, future sins. In Psalms 103, verse 12, it says that once God forgives us, that those, those are our sins between him and us are as far as the distance between the east and west. In other words, he never brings up those sins against. He never holds those sins of it, uh, against us once we're forgiven. And the only response on our part to receive that forgiveness from God is repentance. Now let's talk about repentance because this is very important to understand this, to receive that forgiveness that God has for us. And I want to read that about repentance in 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That patience that it talks about in that scripture, for God waiting for us to come to that point of repentance, is another expression of his tremendous love that he has for each one of us. Well, let's talk about repentance. That word repentance means to turn around. Uh, and it also implies that there is a, a deep sorrow from your heart for rebelling and being disobedient to our Heavenly Father. But along with that is that turning and that desire to turn back to righteousness. Uh, that's what repentance is all about. And repentance is required on our part uh, in order for forgiveness, God's forgiveness, to remove those sins from our lives so there's nothing between us and God, the only way that's going to happen is when we come to that repentive heart. Now let's talk about the other work that was done on the cross, and that was the, the redemption of our souls from uh, death and hell that we talked about quite a bit. The only response on our part that will allow the sinless blood to cover us, uh, to prevent us from being claimed by death and hell, is our faith. Believing that Jesus is the Son of God, believing that God did raise him from the dead, and believing that sacrifice that, God, that Christ made on that cross is for us personal. We're trusting in that. To, uh, for our souls not to be in hell, but with be, to have the eternal life uh, with, with God in heaven. Uh, so it takes faith to, uh, to receive that redemption that Jesus wants to provide uh, uh, for each one of us. Let's turn to another scripture. Uh, and these are the best verses I have found describing exactly what it takes on our part uh, to receive that salvation that Jesus wants to provide us. And it's in Romans 10. Romans 10 verses 8 to 13. Romans 10 verses 8 to 13. For with the heart a person believes resulting in righteousness with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, 
For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call on him. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, there is a calling. The Lord is calling us to receive that redemption and that forgiveness that was provided for us on the cross. And my salvation does not depend on how good I am or how much I've done for, for the Lord, how much I teach or how much I preach or how much I uh, take care of my brothers and sister. None of that is dependent on, on that salvation that, that Jesus wants to provide for me through that sacrifice that he made on the cross. All my righteousness and all your righteousness is like filthy rags. Uh, the scripture tells that compared to God's holiness. So again, it's not going to be any, anything uh, that we do in this earth or the works that we do in ourselves, in our strength, that's going to provide that salvation. Only the sinless blood of Christ and the sacrifice that he made on that cross will provide that for me. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, that uh, we are saved by His grace. And it's our faith in that grace that provides that salvation. And it's not a result of my works that I can boast about my salvation. If I stand before the Lord and say, Lord, you need to allow me to come into your heaven to have that eternal life because of my goodness, that's pride. And that right there is sin in itself. And that's what caused Satan to fall. Uh, so it's not our goodness that'll that'll provide that that salvation for our soul. <clears throat> so a recap: the work of the cross. Two things happen. One is the atonement of the cross, the forgiveness of sin, and the only way that we can see that receive that is through repentance. And then the other work of the cross was our salvation from death and hell. And the only way that we can receive that is by our faith and believing in Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Well, what drives God to desire that connection with us? To give his son up for a sacrifice for our sins. To be willing to forgive us of our sins. Well, I want to recite two verses that tells us what motivates God to do these things. The first one is in John 3, 16, which most of you probably have already heard somewhere along the line. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that those who believe in him will not perish but have eternal life. It's love that motivates him to do that. And then there's another verse I want to uh, share with you. In 1 John, 3, uh, 1 John 3, 1, it says, what, <clears throat> How great a love that God has lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. It's that love that drives him. It's that love that desires him to, to reconnect with us and to claim us as his own to live with us for an eternal life. A love that goes way beyond our understanding. You know, we said earlier that <clears throat> it only takes once to rebel or disobey God for us to suffer the consequences of sin and death. But because of that love we're talking about, God gives us multiple chances to repent and turn back to him and to uh, be a part of that law of the spirit of life. <clears throat> and it comes back to that choice, that free will that God g gave us. Are we going to choose to continue to live under the shroud of death? Or are we going to choose that gift that God gave us and experience his eternal life through the law of the spirit of life. Again, that comes down to our choice. As you've been listening to this video, maybe there's some of you that you have felt a calling 
to reconnect with God. And so, at this moment and at this time, I would like to pause and give the Lord an opportunity to call you out to that love relationship that we've been talking about through this whole video. So I would like you to pause the video at this particular point and just ask the Lord, Lord, do you, are you calling me? Do you want me to be a part of that love relationship? As you were spending that time with the Lord, did you feel a draw to that love relationship, that love that He has for you? If you did, you need to respond in, in uh, rebe uh, repentance and in faith. And you need to respond to that call by calling out to salvation. And how we call out to the Lord is through prayer. So, if you're ready to, to reconnect with the Lord, I would like you to bow your head and to say this prayer after me. Dear God, I know I am a sinner. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ is your Son. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe you raised Jesus to life so that I could have life. I want to trust Jesus as my Savior. I want to follow Jesus as Lord from this day forward. Guide my life and help me to do your will. I pray this in the loving name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you said that prayer, <clears throat> you need to find a family member or a friend who is a Christian and tell them that you just turned your life over to Christ. And if you don't know any Christians, then Find a church that preaches the word, that teaches the word, and tell the pastor that what you have just done, that you have turned your life over to Christ, to be a part of that love relationship he has drawn you to. And then the Lord will move you forward from that point on. Well, I want to thank you for uh, spending this time with me and watching this film. And uh, I pray that God will just bless, bless you as you continue to move forward in Christ. And if I don't see you in this world, I'll see you in the other world beyond where we're together with Christ, uh, living that eternal life in the bond of love uh, in the center of Christ.